Revelation chapter 21, we're talking about heaven today. Do you want to go to heaven? One evangelist asked everybody who wanted to go to heaven to stand up. Everybody in the room stood up except one fellow. He said, mister, don't you want to go to heaven? He said, oh yeah, but I thought you was getting up a load right now. <laughs> stand with me for the reading of God's holy word, if you would, please. We don't know everything about heaven, but the Bible tells us a lot. And we're going to just uh, fly through what the Bible says about heaven today. Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be their God. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there no longer be any death, no longer any mourning or crying or pain, for the former things have passed away. Don't you look forward to that? I want us to pick up again at verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I'll be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and, and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now flip over to verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, a stone of crystal clear jasper. Down at verse 18, we'll pick up once more. He describes the city and he shows John measuring the walls of the city. And then down in verse 18, the material of the wall was jasper. The city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the stone of, city wall, of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each one of the gates a single pearl. And the city, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of the Lord has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. Um, Look down at verse 27. Nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying will ever come into it, but only those whose name are written in the Lamb's book of life. And verse 6 says, He said to me, It's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water without cost. Thank you, Lord, for this holy word about heaven. Help us look forward to our future home. In Jesus' name, teach us by your spirit. Amen. <clears throat> I don't know if you're like I am, but when you go to an old cemetery, do you like to walk around and see the tombstones and read some of the sayings? They, they, some of the old sayings have a lot of meaning to them for me. Um, one in, in the cemetery where my grandparents are buried says, asleep in Jesus, blessed sleep from which one never wakes to weep. I thought that was beautiful. Um, but some of the tombstones are just flat out funny, to tell you the truth. There was one from um, Jones County, Mississippi, a couple of counties from where I was born, the fellow's name was Pease, P-E-A-S. And the tombstone read, this is not Pease, it's just the pod. <laughs> Pease shelled out and went to God. 
some um, friends of mine in a church I pastored came back from the West and they said they saw a tombstone there that says, here lies the body of Lester Moore, shot to death with a 44. No Lester, no more. <laughs> but one of the most um, striking that I have seen, I've seen it in two places, one in a rural cemetery in Indiana and one in Bowling Green, Kentucky in a big city cemetery. And it said, attention traveler, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare yourself and follow me. Very moving. Somebody had written a little card and stuck it up by the top of the tombstone. I read the card that said, to follow you, I cannot consent, for I don't know which way you went. <laughs> I, I shared that once in a revival in uh, Union County. And a fellow came to me after the service and he said, I know what I'm going to put on my wife's uh, tombstone. He was a joker. I shouldn't have even listened anymore, but I did. And I said, what are you going to put on there? It says, uh, he said, I'm going to put, here lies my wife, so let her lie. Now she's at rest. And so am I. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I know this. A hundred years from now, in all likelihood, every one of us is going to be, each one is going to be either in heaven or in hell. Seventy-five years from now, the vast majority of us will be either be in heaven or in hell. Fifty years from now, most of us here will be in heaven or hell. 25 years from now. The truth of it is, none of us knows when. But we've got to get ready for it. Now, years ago, I went to Niagara Falls, and to prepare for it, I looked up all kind of things that we could do on the way up there and while there and on the way back, etc., trying to get ready for the trip. My wife Sandy and I have gone to Israel several times, and we, we try to get ready for it by looking up the places we'll be and preparing for it. Are you preparing for heaven? Because see, we're going to be in this world just a little while, but we're going to be in heaven for all eternity. Don't you want to know what the, God's Word has to say about it? Now, I've heard ministers and others at funerals say, well, we don't know a lot about heaven, but here's something. Well, the truth of it is, we know everything God wants us to know. He gave it to us in his word, and there's quite a bit there. If you've read the book on heaven by Randy Alcorn, I suggest it highly. It is amazing. And I, I, I mean, I've been studying about heaven for many years, but I learned a lot from that book. Heaven, what's it all about? I'm going to share with you 10 things this morning. Catch your breath. Ten things, because we're going to rush right through, okay? And the first thing about heaven is that it is a literal place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. John chapter 14. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, I, I, I don't know why it is. Some people think, well, there's, it's not real. It's just a figment of your imagination. You know, it's just something man-made that we think of for the future to help us get through this life. One lady, I preached a funeral of a godly lady, and her niece came up to me as we were walking to the uh, um, a grave site. And um, I had preached on heaven because this lady really loved the Lord. And her niece said, well, that sounds like a beautiful place, whether it's real or it's just in our mind. And I thought, oh, no. If it's just in our mind, then it's a trickery. And there's nothing to it. But it is real because Jesus told us about it along with telling us other things like he would rise from the dead, which he did. <laughs> and so he proved the reality of it. It is a literal place. I go to prepare a place for you. And the master carpenter has had 
2,000 years now to prepare places for all who will be there. I go to prepare a place. Now, God knew that some people would think it's not literal. And that's why I believe he had the Apostle John to see a person measure the walls. Can you measure the walls of an imaginary place? You can't. You can only measure the walls of what's real. It measured, you know, many feet wide. It measured 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. It's about like from Miami to Denver, Denver to up in Canada, Canada to over to New York, and New York back to Miami. I mean, it's, it's 50 million square miles. That's just the bottom layer. And if each layer is a mile, you can imagine. There's plenty of room there for everyone who ever will come to know Jesus as their Savior. It is a literal place, a literal place. Now, somebody said to me, a young man said to me, and I, I don't blame him, he said, well, Pastor, we talk about heaven, but where is it? Well, in the Bible, they always looked up. They called the stars the heavens, but there was heavens beyond the heavens. There was a literal heaven that was going to come down to the earth when there is a new earth and a new heaven. And that's what John was describing. Now, where is it up there? Um, some may be like uh, Yuri Gagorov, the um, Russian cosmonaut who was the first man into outer space. He was a atheist and he came back and said I didn't see God proves he's not real no God no heaven no hell that's not real that's like sticking your toe in the Atlantic Ocean and saying I didn't feel the Titanic it's not real <laughs> see when when astronomers talk about outer space they don't talk in terms of miles they talk in terms of the speed of light the speed of light 186,000 miles a second and at the speed of light, the sun is eight light minutes away. But the area that the astronomers call the local group, that is the Milky Way galaxy, has a billion, with a B, a billion stars like our sun. That's the local group. One well-known astronomer had his Ph.D. students to take all of the telescopic pictures of outer space, divide it up into one-degree sections, 360 degrees, and he had them count as best they could the number of stars like our sun that could be seen. Now, get this. When they came back with the figures, they estimate now that there are more suns like our star, like stars like our sun, in the world, in the universe, than there are grains of sand on every beach and every river in this world. More stars than grains of sand in this world. Yeah, I think God's got plenty of room to plant heaven out there somewhere, and one day he'll bring it, and he'll put it on the earth. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Well, the second thing I want you to see, not only is it a literal place, but it is a prepared place, a prepared place. Someone said heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Hebrews 11, 6 says, God has prepared for Christians a heavenly city. Matthew 25, 34, God has prepared heaven from the foundations of the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I has not seen nor his ear heard nor has entered into the heart of man the glories, the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who love him. It is a prepared place, a literal place, and it's a prepared place. But number three in your outline, heaven is a place of happy reunion, a place of happy reunion. Who are you looking forward to seeing when you go to heaven? That person's face comes before you right now, doesn't it, in your mind? 
always loved my granddaddy. He had time for us kids. I'd go stay with him two weeks in the summertime. He had a pond behind his house. He'd take me fishing in the morning, and he'd take me back again in the evening if I wanted. It was so much fun. I loved my mom and dad. Mom's been gone 12 years, dad four almost. Who are you looking forward to seeing? I believe there's going to be a place of happy reunion in heaven. That's the whole gist of what God is saying about heaven to us. When you, when you go to the funeral and your loved one is a Christian and you're a Christian and you say goodbye, it's only for a little while because before long we'll be with them again. And there we'll worship the Lord forever and ever and ever. Heaven is a place of happy reunion. When I pastored in Louisiana, I pastored um, a fellow named Solly Thomas. Actually, he wasn't a church member at first, but he was a mechanic. And I would visit him and share the gospel with him. He didn't receive it first, but one day, Solly had been working on a car. He had grease on his face, I remember. And Solly heard the gospel in his heart. And he prayed with me to receive Jesus as his Savior. And I looked up and big old alligator tears were coming down his eyes, cutting through that grease. I said, Solly, what are the tears for? He said, you don't know my background, do you, Pastor? I said, no, I don't. He said, my daddy left the my mom, and I never knew him, still don't know him, don't know where he is, don't know if he's living. And I live with my mom, but when I was two years old, she passed away, and I don't have any memories of my mom. From that time on, I live with my aunt and uncle, or this aunt and uncle, or the other one, or with my grandparents sometimes. But he said, wherever I went, one thing I carried with me was a picture of my mother. And he said, every one of them told me, your mama was a good Christian woman. And he said, these tears mean I'm going to get to see mama again one day. Yes, and you're going to get to see your loved one in Christ. Now somebody may say, well, I don't know about that because... Aunt Betty was a strong Christian, and I am too, but Aunt Betty and I didn't get along. I don't know if I want to know her in heaven. Well, when you get to heaven, God's going to give you a, a new full heart in Aunt Betty too, and you'll get along just fine, all right? It's going to be a place of happy reunion. And then, fourthly, heaven is a place where God is, and that's the main thing about it. It's a place where God is. Did you notice when John measured the city, it was 1,500 miles wide, long, and high. It was a perfect cube. There's only one other perfect cube in the Bible, and that's in the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was prepared a place in the temple where God was thought to dwell. And heaven is the perfect cube where God dwells. God's going to be there. Have you ever been to a worship service that just really touched your heart? Something the singer sang or something you sang or some thought the Lord put in your heart or something the pastor shared or somebody else shared in Sunday school or another time? It just really touched you and you left feeling God's in this place. Well, that's the way it's going to be in heaven all the time. God is in this place. I, I remember being a child looking up and the ceiling in our old country church had little dots in it, and I remember counting the dots, wishing the time away, you know. And, um, I, you, you know, I, I can't help it, but the thought crossed my mind, are we just going to worship every day? Is that all we're going to do in heaven? No, we're going we're gonna to work. We're going to serve him there. But it's going to be full worship, and that worship's going to be the most invigorating, exciting you have ever had. And it'll just be continuous. God is in that place. I get excited about it when I think about it. 
Now, there's no church building there in heaven. No church building. And there's no preaching in heaven. All right, who was that I saw went like this? No preaching, but there'd be plenty of singing. I'll be out of a job there, but Russ will still be going strong. Be singing there. There's no church building there because churches are built as a place to come and worship God and get in His presence and get filled to go out and do His work. But in heaven, God's there all the time. So there's no need of a church building or preaching because we're in His presence all the time. And then fifthly, heaven is a place of complete joy. Complete joy. Now in this world, you have tribulation. That's what Jesus said. That's what Job said before him. There's going to be trouble and heartache in this world, but not when we get to heaven. The Bible says every tear will be wiped away. There'll be no more sadness because God's going to remove it. There'll be no such thing as school shooters coming in and shooting up the place. Nothing like that in heaven. There'll be nothing but joy. There's no lameness, God says, walk. No deafness. I won't need these glasses and you won't need yours. Throw away your Geritol. You're not going to need it in heaven. And your vitamins. I drink emergency every day. I'm not going to need it in heaven. One fellow went to heaven as an elderly man. His wife had preceded him a couple of years. When he got up there, she showed him around Glory Boulevard and Hallelujah Street and the River of Life. And the husband said to his wife, he said, just think, if it hadn't been for all that low cholesterol oat bran you've been feeding me all these years, I could have been here five years earlier. <laughs> heaven is a place of complete joy. There are burdens here, but none there. Near my parents' gravestone is another grave on which is written these words, earth has no sorrows that heaven will not erase. I'm talking about heaven. Wonderful. And then heaven is a place of abundant riches, sixthly. A place of abundant riches. Now, we make way too much of riches in this world. Way too much of it. But there's some riches that can't be valued enough. The joy that we have, and heaven's full of it. Um, we, we value electric lights. And in heaven, there will be no light bill because God's our light all the time. And it's going to be light day and night. There is no night. We value rest here, and the Bible says we will rest in Jesus. We value um, a work here, and we will work in the Lord. R.G. Lee, a great Baptist preacher from many generations ago, used to preach on heaven often. He had a stroke a few months before he passed away and didn't say anything for some time. He just was able to lay in bed. But just before he passed on, it was as if he saw something that the others couldn't see, and he sat up in bed and reached out, and he said these words, his last words, I didn't do it justice. I didn't do it justice. That's heaven I'm talking about. Oh, it's wonderful. We value gold here, but there it's so plentiful that the streets are paved in it, and it's so pure that it's almost translucent. Everything we value here is there, and then some. We value beautiful, pristine, white beaches. We value the, the, uh, the beautiful of the trees that change color in the fall. But just imagine, it's going to be better than that in heaven all the time. We value beautiful sunsets and sunrises, and God's going to paint those for us day after day. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. We get excited about things here. Um, Kent, I saw a Texas A&M play baseball the other night on TV, SEC tournament. People got so excited when they won the game. We get excited when Kentucky wins a basketball game. I've got your attention now, don't I? You know, but listen, we ought to get excited about what matters, and that's Jesus and heaven to come. You're going to live in heaven one day. 
forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. All eternity you will live there. Well, one more thing about heaven. It's a place of endless time. They said number eight, number seven, I believe it is. A place of endless time. Miss Kim, when I was in Korea as a missionary, they taught us a, a Korean proverb, time is like an era. Time is like an era, meaning it, it flies by. Some of you remember when Paducah didn't have 486 restaurants. <laughs> you remember the days when there was no Qdoba and Texas Roadhouse and Longhorn and all those things that make you hungry just before you get out of church, you know? You remember those times. Time flies. Turn around. And those kids graduating today will be having kids of their own and their kids will be graduating. But in heaven, time goes on. And it's a joyous time. The newspapers, when D.L. Moody turned 62, that was old back then, they had captions in bold letters, old Mr. Moody has birthday. Made him mad. He said, well, old? He said, I'm not old. He said, why, when I've been in heaven 10,000 years, I will have just started. And that's the way it is. It's a place of endless time. One child misquoted Matthew 28, where Jesus said, I'll be with you to the end of the ages. She had to stand up in Sunday school and quote that verse. She ended it by saying, Jesus said, I'll be with you till the end of the sermon." And then eighthly, place of, heaven is a place of full knowledge, full knowledge. The Bible says we will know as we are known. We will know as we are known. We will know how much our sin hurt Jesus. We will know how great a price Jesus paid for us when he died on the cross. We will know how deep and magnificent is the love of God. It's a place of full knowledge. Ninthly, heaven is a place of service. The Bible says his servants will serve him. Now, I don't know about those in the Muslim religion. They believe that in heaven... Every man will be served by a thousand maidens. That doesn't sound much like heaven for the maidens to me, the thousand maidens. Why would any woman want to be a Muslim, you know? Some of you ladies are saying, I've done enough service for guys all these years. I'm not, I don't want any more of that. But no, in, in heaven, all of us are going to work. But have you ever, have you ever done a, a work that was so invigorating and you could do it, and you were good at it, and you just enjoyed it. And at the end of the day, you were just as strong. You didn't need to rest. You were just as invigorated as you were when you began. That's the way it's going to be in heaven. Because the Bible says we'll rest, and it also says we will work. So our work will be like rest. How wonderful that's going to be in heaven. And then lastly, I want you to see, heaven is a place of holiness. The Bible makes it clear, no immorality there, no wrongdoing there. All is just and right and pure and holy in God's sight. Now, in this world, it's not like that. My sister, her husband was a minister of music in a large church in the Houston area. They lived in Kingwood. And one day, she heard a noise in the front of the house she was in the back of the house doing some work and she uh, started in in the hallway and and her eye caught somebody in the house people had broken in to steal things she went back in the bedroom locked the door got under the bed and called 911 and fortunately she was fine but there's not going to be any break-ins in heaven <laughs> I had a lady one day who hadn't necessarily lived a godly life she said, Pastor, 
I don't want to go into heaven in the open door. I just want to just sneak in, just squeak in. There won't be any sneaking in to heaven. If you're not holy, you're not going there. And that gives me a problem, and it gives you a problem, because the Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we got a problem. How are we going to go to heaven since we're sinners, and the Bible says not going to be any sin there? That's where Jesus comes in. See, he who says, come unto me, he's the one that took our place on the cross. And so when our time comes, if we have Christ living in our hearts, when our time comes, God doesn't see us in our sin. He sees Jesus in his holiness, and he accepts us in his place. Charles Fuller went up to Washington, D.C. to visit his senator, and uh, he started to go into the Senate building, and a burly guard stepped in the way and said, Sir, you can't come in here. He said, Well, I'm uh, Dr. Charles Fuller. I, I've come to see my senator. He invited me here. He said, uh, Fuller, you said, Your name's not on the list. You're not getting in. He said, But he invited, he said, Doesn't matter. You're not getting in this building. And about that time, Fuller happened to come around the corner and entered the building. And he said to the guard, oh, he's all right, he's with me. And Fuller entered into the Senate building, as it were, on the coattails of, senator Fuller, of his senator. And that's the way we're going to go to heaven. Not on our own merit, not what we've done, but on what Jesus has done in our place. There is no other way. You can't get good enough to go to heaven. Don't try to wait till you get some things straight in your life and then receive Christ. It won't work. I'm telling you, Christ and Christ alone is the way to heaven. But you can have Christ if you're thirsty for him. Notice it says here in verse 6, It is done, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life. He's talking about the river of life without cost. If you want Christ, you can go to heaven. If you receive him, you'll be with him in heaven. Now I want us to just bow our heads in prayer if we would. If you know for a fact that you're going to heaven, you're as sure of it as if you're already there, would you just raise your hand right now? I know I'm going to heaven, amen. Hands all over this building. Now put your hands down. Some of you couldn't raise your hand with that because you don't know for sure but you can you can know for sure right now if you would pray and receive Christ as your Savior determine that with his help you'll live for him you can go to heaven too would you just pray this prayer with me or something like it Lord Jesus I know I'm a sinner I need you Lord please forgive my sin and cleanse my life and help me live in heaven with you forever. With your head still bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer, would you raise your hand as a testimony to him? I'll embarrass no one here. If you prayed and received Christ, would you just raise your hand? Somebody else. Yes, amen. And we thank you, dear Lord Jesus, that you're still in the habit of saving those who turn to you. And we ask that you would help us get excited about heaven, so excited that we tell others and help others to go there. In Jesus' name, amen.